Shalom, shalom, shalom to everyone watching. This is Rabbi Moshe Utero. This morning, a beautiful morning, is just prior to uh, 4th of July. It's the 3rd of July, and we're coming to you directly from Pompano Beach, Florida. So we want to continue with um, this series that we're doing, which is the Sefer HaIkarim, and we're now in chapter 36. We have one more chapter before we read and start another book in the Sefer HaIkarim series. So please stay tuned with us, share this video, and very important also is be part of what we're doing at the Ways of Israel. You can do so by downloading membership. It's absolutely uh, a free process and you can upload it. And membership is only uh, per year $100, so it's very, very economical. And in turn, we'll send you out a membership ID card that you are a member of the Ways of Israel uh, community. So be part of what we're doing, and this way you help support the Ways of Israel. Well, let's go directly into the Shi'or for this morning, as we are starting chapter 36, which Rabbi Albo begins speaking about, or continuing the idea of the love of God. We've already seen that the fear and joy is part of the whole entire process of affirming um, the faith, as it were, the fear of God, the joy of the joy to rejoice. And now we bring again, as he continues, the topic of the love of God. The love of God gives joy. It brings delight to the soul. So he connects the idea of joy, which is something very basic, with the idea of the love of God. And it brings happiness to the soul. Ordinary love of a thing that cannot be obtained or that is difficult of attainment causes trouble and confusion to the soul, which cast about by means of, to obtain the object of its love. And for this reason, the lovers are always in pain and sorrow until they obtain the object of their love. But the love of God doesn't cause trouble or confusion to the soul, although God is not a thing that can be obtained. <laughs> and the reason is because the little of him that a man can attain gives wonderful joy and pleasure and delight to the soul. This is the way of the lover. The little that he obtains of the object of his love is much pleasanter to him than the greater deal of something else. This is, what, this is why Solomon praises this kind of love above all others. How far and how pleasant art thou, O love, for delights? The meaning is, how superior is the beauty and the pleasure of the love of God for those of any other love. For this love, one of delights, a man has a wonderful delight in it, and therefore are as many kinds of delight in it as there are different kinds of understanding. The entire kind, the entire or the other kinds of love, gives a person a great pain before he obtains the object of his love, and when he has obtained a little thereof, he finds pleasure therein. But the pain increases until the person or he obtains the whole of it, and since it's po it's possible of attainment, and when he has obtained it, it is a whole of it, his love ceases, and his desires subside. But the love of God is different. Man rejoices in the little that he obtains. And when he considers how great is that worth of, of the object to be obtained, he takes delight in that which he obtains without any addition of pain because he knows that God cannot be obtained. And therefore he takes wonderful delight in the little that he obtains. And the more he attains, the greater is the love and the delight. Moreover, this love cannot cease because the object is infinite. As one attains a certain degree and finds delight therein, he is eager to get more and so without end, and therefore cannot stop. But the person joys, but the person's joy continues with the little that he has or what he attains. And as we have explained in the 15th chapter of the second book, the greater the worth of the thing, desire the greater the joy and delight in as much as attained. And therefore, 
even if he searches for the love and attainment causes um, a, a man great trouble, he will not, he will not, on that account, desist from the pursuit where he considers, or when he considers the great, and that is sought, and particularly the person who serves from the love has no reason to regard any utility or damage that may accrue to him from his service. And because his purpose is merely to do the will of the beloved, hence he ignores any benefit uh, or injury which may cause which may cause or come provided the beloved is benefited. Thus J Jonathan, Jonathan, because of his great love for David, cared not about the fact that he would lose the kingdom as long as David was alive. And Saul, Shaul, said to him, For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the earth, thou shalt not be established nor thy kingdom. His purpose was to benefit David, whom he loved, even if he did not do any injury to himself, or even if he did injury to himself. In this way, we see true love, which considers only the interest of the beloved, whereas the love which considers the interest of the lover is the love which man has for animals, because all that he benefits he receives from them. And the love which is due to the protection of injury is like the love of a man for a dog. A man loves dog because they protect him from injury. True love is that which a man has for the beloved, for the sake of the beloved alone, having no other purpose than to do the will of the beloved because he does not love the beloved for any cause other than the beloved himself. Love, which is due to an extraneous cause, is sure to change and cease. As our rabbis say, all love, which is dependent upon something extraneous, ceases with the cessation of that thing. But the love, which is for the sake of the beloved, solely and for no other cause, will last as long as the beloved endures. Now, since God endures forever, Love for him never ceases. Such love as this, which considers only the interest of the beloved, can only exist in men of intelligence and understanding. For the love of another for his, own, for his own sake can be due only to the intellect of the beloved. And therefore, if the beloved loses his mind or dies, love ceases, because the beloved object is not there anymore. And since the soul leaves the dead body, now inasmuch as the best of all kinds of love is found only in persons of intellect and understanding, a person is praised or blamed for it. Hence, there must be no admixture of compulsion therein, for the person is not praised or blamed for that which he is compelled to do, but only for a thing that altogether is dependent upon his choice. And this is what the, why the patriarch Abraham was praised for this kind of love more than others, as in the Bible calls him Abraham, my friend, because he had no other purpose in mind than to do the will of God, whom he loved. Now, was there any other cause compelling him to do this? For there is, was no element of compulsion in the incidence of Isaac's sacrifice. Not even the commandment of God was compulsion. As our rabbis explain in connection to with this verse in Genesis, Abraham said to God, Lord of the universe, it is known to thee that, that when thou didst say to me, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou loveth, even Isaac, and offer him to me as a burnt offering, I could have said in reply, Hast thou, hast not thou said to me, For an Isaac shall the seed be called to thee? But I did not say so. I suppressed my compassion, and did not criticize. Thy conduct, it seems clear from this, that even though God commanded him, Abraham was not compelled to obey, seeing that he could have excused himself on the grounds, on good grounds, if he had desired. But he did not do so. 
He suppressed a father's compassion for his son for the sake of his love for God. This is why the credit in the incident of the sacrifice is given to Abraham and not to Isaac. Though the latter was 37 years old, as our rabbis say, Abraham could have avoided the act of sacrificing his son. But Isaac had no excuse for refusing to offer himself when he was commanded to do so. This is the reason also why in our prayers we also mention the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham and not to mention the sacrifice of all the pious and holy men who offered their lives to sanctify the name of God, like Rabbi Akiba and his associates and all the holy ones in every generation. The reason is because all others offered their, uh, their lives in fulfillment of the commandment, and ye shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel, whereas Abraham was not compelled by God's command. Moreover, he knew very well what he was doing. For more than three days it left between the time when he was commanded to take his son and the time of the sacrifice, as we read. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw a place afar off. An absolutely free act is one of the opposite which the person at the time of doing the act knew how to do it and what was able to do it without any prevention of hindrance and yet chose to do what he did is not something else. But if the person did not know or understand how to do the opposite and did what he did without distinguishing between the things and its opposite merely by accident or by habit or custom because he could not do the opposite, his is not a free act for which he preserves praises if if it's a good and or blame it if it was a bad. Even an offering, which is a good act, if a person brings it without distinguishing between the good and evil merely as a result of habit or custom is worth nothing. This should speak to us of our customs of praying by rote. Are we doing it by habit or are we doing it because it is our decision to do so. And this is the meaning of the verse in Ecclesiastic. Guard thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Take care of your going that there should be the result of discrimination and not of the habit and customs. The same idea is expressed in the whole words in the sequel. And be ready to hearken. It is better, to, it is better than when fools give sacrifice for they know not what they do is evil. The meaning is that to be ready to listen, to do the words of the wise is better than the offerings which the fools bring. For by listening to the words of the wise, a person learns and distinguishes between good and evil and does good as a result of the perfect discrimination because of the thing is good and keeps away from evil because he knows that it is evil. This is not the case of the action of the fools. Even the offerings which they bring is not accounted to them as service, because since they are not ready to listen to the words of the wise, they do not understand the difference between the good and the evil, and do not know how to do uh, evil freely. Hence, even the offerings, which is a good act, is not credited to them, because they do not do it from choice between good and evil. They do not know how to do evil, and they bring the offerings not because they chose in preference to do the opposite, which is evil, but as a result of habit and customs. <coughs> My friends, getting into a habit and custom sometimes is not a good thing, as we are reading from Rabbi Albo. And therefore they do not deserve to be praised for it. For a, a person deserves praise for a good act, only if he knows how to do evil and has the ability to do it and yet chooses to do good. According to the person who serves from the love, deserves praise only, only if his service is prompted by true love, in which there is no mixture of compulsion of protection from injury or utility. The love that gives delight is deserving of eternal and infinite reward. 
Solomon refers this in his Songs of Solomon, or Songs of Songs. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, he would entirely be contempt. Be contempt. The infinite cannot be exchanged for the finite, etc. All substance of his house means all the temporary and physical. For what? For that which he expresses to God. It's not suffice. And this, you should have this in mind as we enter into the last chapter of Book Three of Rabbi Abo's Sefer Ha'ikarim, Ha'ikarim, because he continues this idea of the love between God and man, and between man and God. And this we'll say, take a look at in Chapter Thirty-Seven, the last chapter of Book Number Three of Sefer Ha'ikarim. There are an additional book, which we will go into it at a later time. But think about this. When you say of the love of God and you give sadaka, you give charity, it's nothing that we can connect to. It's the minimal thing that we can do. There are some minimal things that we can do to show our love towards God and how what a greater thing than to be able to do sadaka. Sadaka, sadaka is what lays out the foundation of kindness and justice within our own realm. Do today what you should have been doing many years ago and give. If you haven't started, start now by giving. By giving to any Torah institution. By supporting different Torah teachers. And you could do so today by donating Rebelo, whatever amount you wish, and thus begin to practice Sadaka. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero. May God bless you in this week and continue to bless you every single day as he gives you the wisdom and knowledge as you learn the words of the Torah. Shalom, shalom.